I try to keep an open door policy so that when I'm in town, um, and some of the students will claim that I'm not in town much, but when I'm in town, the door is always open and people are more than welcome to make an appointment. If they don't make an appointment, they can sit and wait till the door is where, when I'm not busy and drop on in and talk about things. And that, I think, provides a chance for conversation about a number of topics. First and foremost, make sure that the graduate students feel as though there's a place they can go, that they can register their concerns, that it would be absolutely confidential. We have and continue to have, at least, and I'm sure it's the same in all around campus, a lot of what I'll call group meetings with the students. And I think the dynamic between the doctoral students or just the graduate students in general is very important in the sense that many times I think the faculty member, and it doesn't have to be the department chair, but the faculty member as part of the group meeting has got to be able to um, instill an open communication about the good, the bad, and the ugly, which is sometimes all good things happen in the group meeting. You know, this worked, I got this data, isn't this great? And then there's some meetings where this failed, I broke this device, oh my God, I got X and I'm supposed to get Y, why did I not get Y, you know, do you really want me to tell you I got X? Right? And I can tell you on and on stories. But, but the group meeting has got to be arranged and run in such a fashion that all the stuff comes out, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. I have a pretty hands-off attitude towards exactly what will each student do. Some of you are supposed to smile now. Um, I don't think it's easy for me to say we are going exactly there and you will do this and this and this in your first year. And in a way that's intentional. Uh, I think it helps the students sort of be forced to develop their own scientific opinion. Where should we go? I should, I should have said at the beginning, I, I'm a physical chemist by training and we do biological fluorescence microscopy. So it's pretty hard science, but it's getting squishier as time goes on. And so I think this makes anxiety in some students because they want to know exactly what to do next the way they always got to know in their classes. And that's sort of not the way research is, and so you sort of dive into that problem. I'm just going to quote Pablo Picasso. He said, if you know exactly what you're going to do, what's the point of doing it? And that's some of what I try to bring to research. These days, the students are quite adept at knowing where to look for it on the web, and so it's a matter of just simply giving them little hints as to where to look. But there are famous examples where famous scientists fudge the data to make it perfect, and it turns out they were perfectly right about what's underlying the data. Gregor Mendel, counting those peas that wrinkled and, and smooth, faked the data. The charge to mass ratio of the electron the data was <laughs> so, so there's a lot of, of instances where people knew exactly what they wanted to get and got it, and were actually right about what it should have been, too. So it's a strange brew. He said, uh, slow down, reflect more, and publish less. Uh, I used to do science that was called gas phase physical chemistry and we really measured stuff. And when you had it right, you knew you had it right, you could prove it. So now it's biology. <laughs> it's a very different game. And, and there are these fields that are just muddy and people can't even reproduce each other's experiments trying to do roughly the same thing. And sometimes the race is to the swift and the strong and all that. Oh, I don't know how to fix any of that except to keep plugging away at doing it right.